Today I'm going to talk about a book I just finished. It's a well-known book. It's called The Odyssey by Homer. There's lots of videos on BookTube about this book and I uh, recently read this um, version with translation by Robert Fagels. It's a Penguin classic. This is the second time I read this book. The first time I read it in college for a class that I took was called The Epic. It was taught by an outstanding professor named Peter Dale Scott, who was a poet and also wrote about politics in the United States. He, you, his class in college was one of the absolute best classes I've taken in college. You know, I was thinking about my college and I took about 60 classes in the, the years that I was in college and there were about five or seven classes that were just outstanding. And this one class that I took with Peter Dale Scott called the Epic was one of those classes. When I, one thing I thought about when I was in my last year of college was I thought that I, I realized that many of the classes that I liked the best were because the instructor was so great. It wasn't necessarily the topic. It was the instructor and that made it really click for me and made it work for me and made it one of my favorite classes. So in my senior year, I, um, I looked for classes by professors who were considered the best teachers in my university. That's how I came to this class called the Epic. We read uh, Homer, I remember, and we also read the uh, Dante's Inferno. I still have a copy of the, the version we read where Richard Latimer's Odyssey. One thing I like about BookTube is that the, the, all the evaluation of the, the classics, every generation receives this Western canon of books that have been handed down to us, you know, decade after decade and generation after generation and millennia after millennia in the case of the Odyssey. And we should evaluate these books that are handed down to us and determine if they really mean stuff, something to us. Certainly they'll mean something to one person and not mean something to another, but I think this process of going through all these books in the Western canon and giving an authentic evaluation of what we think in our generation is really important. And rather than just rubber stamping everything, like, oh, this was handed down to us, rubber stamp, handed down to the next generation. You know, say what we think, read the books. Some books should be passed down to the next generation, and some books, maybe they aren't that great, and they shouldn't be passed down. And we should say what we think, and that's the way the process should work for um, the Western canon. Certainly this book has been passed down and when you read it, you know, you can tell why. It's just, it's very imaginative. It's a great story of morals and revenge and families and um, the Greek life. It's, a, it's also a great view into how the Greeks saw the gods and how the, they, how the Greeks saw how the gods interacted with humans. It's such a great insight into the Greek culture. The storytelling is, is very um, sparse and it moves along very well. Um, it wasn't super easy to read. There's, there's 24 books. Usually each, section, each time I picked up the book, I read one whole book and then I put it down and read the next book the next time. And, and I didn't do it every day because um, it, sometimes I had to kind of work up to it in myself and so before I started the next chapter. But I, I was very into the story. It's just so imaginative and the characters are really well done. The characters have integrity. You know, Odysseus is integrity the whole way through the story and Telemachus and Penelope and then there's these other secondary characters like the swineherd and uh, Menelaus and um, Antinous and the Cyclops and Ceres. So, you know, just great characters that, I, that it, when I think about them in my mind, I can just grasp them.
And, and it's so interesting, too, the way that the Greeks saw their gods as having all these prejudices, spite, you know, like Poseidon. He's so spiteful towards Odysseus. And Zeus is kind of there, but he's not really there. And then all at once he is there. And um, Athena, you know, she's attentive, but, but then sometimes she's not. And so uh, it's so different than the Christian divinity. You know, if you had to criticize the book, you would criticize some of the repetitive uh, events like uh, slaughtering of animals for banquets, the wine-colored sea, and the um, rose-colored dawn, you know, but, you know, but it does work, and that does kind of add a certain beat to the epic. And I was, I was really excited about the ending, and I was so excited, I was thinking of doing a painting and um, if I get to that, I'm going to add it on later on. I'm going to add it to this uh, video. So look for that. I do have some negative things to say about this Penguin Edition. And it goes back to, um, it, it goes back to things I've mentioned in other videos, but maybe you haven't seen it, which I'm going to expand on. And that is the introductions. I'm really realized in the last 15 years that I'm really unhappy with all the introductions in these Penguin classics. Um, I, I just think it's ridiculous to ask somebody to read these introductions before you've read the work. You know, if, if you, you know, like if you've picked up Homer and you've never read it, and then you don't even know if you like it. You surely you've heard that the praise of it, but you don't know if you like it. So read it, and then if you like it, then go read the introduction. Because the introduction is filled with all this scholastic and analytical data. And the Odyssey is a book about emotions. It's about feelings. It's about um, social structures. It, th that's what it's about. But the, but, and so therefore, the, the, the introduction is disconnected from the actual epic. For example, when you open the introduction, he, the first thing that they go through is the text. They say, we're going to start with the text that we work for, with to translate Homer. Then we're going to go backwards all the way to the, the, the furthest text that we can find back in the, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, right? So I don't care about that. That's just like facts and analytical information, okay? Then they go into, um, then there's a section on the Odyssey and the Iliad. They suggest that the Odyssey was written before the Iliad. You know, what do I care? If you're obsessed, if you read the Odyssey and you're like obsessed with the Odyssey and you just, uh, you just think it's the greatest thing ever, sure, you might wanna read more about the details of it, and when it was done and all these different things. But, but as an introduction, you don't know if you like it. So why would you, it's cruel to put this information in, in front of somebody who's never read the book. Then they go into the translation and translating certain Greek words and how they tr look in Greek and how they look in English and you know the, all these subtle variations. Another kind of analytical idea. To me, it's just cruel to put up this wall in front of a new student and ask them to climb over this wall before they get to the riches of the Odyssey. Uh, I'm going to continue to um, comment on these introductions. Uh, I think they should be skipped. They should concentrate more on the story, more on the emotions. It's a book about emotions. It's a book with a great story. They should talk about the structure of the story. They should talk about the emotions of the story. But they talk about all these other analytical, scientific things. You know, I'm very against having a scientific eye and looking at literature. I think that ruins literature. And I think that that is a problem in our educational institutions. Let literature, you know, be about literature. Don't put this science on top of it. Anyway, so 
I know that I realize that's kind of negative and there's some people with plushy personalities that that might um, bristle at this negative negativity. I'm not criticizing Homer. I'm just criticizing the way Penguin has done their introduction. I like the book. I recommend the book and it's not, you know, it's, it, it certainly deserves the accolades that it has been awarded throughout the decades. Okay, another problem is the maps. Now, in this book, they have some maps in here. And I was really troubled by these. They really, they really um, kind of set me off. He's got um, Homeric, ge Homeric Geography, Mainland Greece, this one, and this one shows Ithaca, which is good, but it doesn't show um, Troy. Then he has Homeric geography, the Peloponnese, and this shows Ithaca, and then, then he's got um, Homeric geography, the Aegean and Asia Minor, this one. So there's a lot of cities on these maps. This one includes Troy. So I'm looking, I'm reading the, the story, and I'm seeing Odysseus is visiting these places, has Ithaca, has um, Troy, but he goes to all these other places, and I'm looking at these maps, three different maps, and there's got all these cities here. There must be, you know, maybe 50 to 70 cities with dots and names, and they're all here on this maps, and I'm going through all of them, and none of them are, match the names of the cities or the islands in the story. What's that about? So I'm like, well, where did he go? There's no like line for the, his pathway to, from Troy to Ithaca. So then I go online and I find some maps. Oh, here's where Odysseus traveled. And it turns out he starts in Troy and then he goes down the, um, the Aegean Sea and he goes past Crete and the, past the Peloponnese, and then he enters into these seas on the, um, the south of Italy. And the, the, he, the, 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 the truth is, where he was going on his journey was on the Italian side of Greece. But all these maps are um, the Peloponnese, southern Greece, and eastern Greece where he was on Western Greece. That's where all his travels were. And I'm gonna show some of these maps. So like, why did they show these three maps? You know, it's, it, why did they, I just can't, it really trips me up. I don't know why they showed these maps. Really puzzled by that. And thanks for listening to that. Okay, as it turns out, I was able to get started on my painting. It's pretty much finished. You know, I might change a few things after I look at it for a while, but here's the basic painting I have. And this painting is based on a scene uh, toward the, uh, one, of, one of the last books of the Odyssey. This scene is uh, the, the beginning of book 22. And um, so I'm gonna read the passage and then I'll show you the painting. Odysseus has returned to the hall He's disguised as a kind of a beggar. He has met the challenge of a stringing Odysseus's bow. He's shot the arrow through the axes. And now he, uh, people are kind of in the hall, all the suitors are there and they're all looking at him. So they say, um, now stripping back his rags, Odysseus, master of craft and battle, vaulted onto the great threshold, gripping his bow and quiver bristling arrows and poured his flashing shafts before him, loose at his feet and thundered out to all the suitors. Look, your crucial test is finished, now at last, but another target's left that no one hit before. We'll see if I can hit it. Apollo, give me glory. With that, he's trained a stabbing arrow on Antinous. Just lifting a gorgeous golden loving cup in his hands, just tilting the two-handed goblet back to his lips, about to drain the wine and slaughter the last thing on the suitor's mind. Who could dream that one foe in that crowd of feasters, however great his power, would bring down death on himself and black doom? But Odysseus aimed and shot Antinous square in the throat, 
and the point went stabbing clean through the soft neck and out. And off to the side he pitched, the cup dropped from his grasp as the shaft sank home, and the man's lifeblood came spurting from his nostrils, thick red jets, a sudden thrust of his foot. He kicked away the table. Food showered across the floor, the bread and meat soaked in a swirl of bloody filth. The suitors burst into uproar all throughout the house when they saw their leader down. So here I have uh, Odysseus, the small character there, and um, he's holding his bow, and here's Antinous with an arrow through his throat, and the blood is splurting out through his uh, nose. So that's the, the scene I captured here. And um, I put, you know, the, in, this, in, in, the, um, in the end of the previous chapter, Zeus caused some thunder. And so I, I um, interpreted that as lightning to go along with the thunder. So if you see in the windows, I'm showing lightning in the windows for uh, some extra added effect. So that's it. <laughs> Thanks for watching.